This video is sponsored by Twin Mirror. What's up, Wisecrack? Helen here, and today we're talking about everyone's favorite guilty pleasure, true crime. Between all the docu-series, podcasts, books, and Reddit threads, it seems that audiences today can't get enough of real-life stories about gruesome violence. This obsession has become so prevalent as to even inspire satire. And then there's this bop. So there's clearly something compelling about true crime, and the way it lets us consume content about grisly murder from the comfort of our couches. But what does that say about us as human beings, and as a society? Are we all secret wannabe serial killers, nosy voyeurs, or both? Or does true crime serve some kind of real emotional or psychological function? Let's unravel the mystery in this Wisecrack edition, why we can't stop watching true crime. But before we get into it, I want to talk about this video sponsor, Twin Mirror. Twin Mirror is an exciting game that's finally made its way onto Steam. In it, you embody Sam, a journalist who has returned to his West Virginia hometown after his old friend, Nick, dies under mysterious circumstances, and the story only gets more complex from there. Sam's entire existence is complicated by the presence of the Devil, a more sociable version of himself that only he can see, who helps Sam access feelings he normally can't, such as empathy. Sam, with help from the Devil, investigates his friend Nick's death by re-examining his hometown and the people who live there, including Nick's girlfriend and his teenage daughter. The game also lets you access flashes from Sam's memory, helping you piece together exactly how everybody got where they are, and how they can possibly move forward. It's a fascinating, often eerie game that gives you all the thrills of solving a juicy mystery. Plus, it delves into topics that we here at Wisecrack really love, like self-perception, moral relativity, societal pressures, and more. To get your own copy of Twin Mirror and start playing today, click the link in the video description. And now, back to the show. To understand the contemporary obsession with true crime, we have to look back at the genre's historical development. Now, human beings have loved stories about murder and punishing murderers since biblical times. But the mass production of true crime media can be traced back to one 15th century invention, the printing press. Apologies to those of you who thought we were about to mention the invention of the spring coil. At the time, public execution was still the preferred method of punishment for capital crimes. So entrepreneurial printers started selling broadsides, or large posters, at the gallows, which detailed those crimes. This gave spectators context for the execution. As they became extremely popular, these posters evolved into folded pamphlets and started being circulated far and wide. Publishers caught on and began printing and distributing an unprecedented amount of true crime pamphlets across Europe. These early pamphlets were especially popular among clergy, who presented them as morality tales. The stories often included seedy details about the perpetrator's moral descent into violent crime, starting with such sins as gambling, going into debt, and drinking. I'm only two out of three, so I should be good, for now. This degeneracy then culminated in bloody murder. The message was straightforward. Stay on the narrow path of salvation through Jesus Christ or suffer the fate of one of these miscreants. The popularity of true crime proved enduring. In Victorian England, it took the form of serialized penny dreadfuls about detectives and criminals. In the American Old West, where large-scale printing was harder to come by, criminals' dastardly deeds were passed down via murder ballads. And with each new advancement in mass media technology came a new wave of true crime. By the time the 24-hour news networks hit the scene, audiences in the latter half of the 20th century could be treated to nightly tales of cold-blooded killings. Today's media landscape of endless podcasts and streaming services is no different. Much of the true crime produced today featured events that took place some time ago and were covered extensively by the news media of the time. This wealth of archival material and an inexpensive production model have made it easy to re-examine these past cases, and audiences are here for it. So why has our demand for retellings of bloody murders sustained itself for so many centuries? Why do the most heinous crimes committed by mankind make good fodder for casual entertainment? Well, neurology gives us one simple answer. Witnessing cases of violence triggers the release of adrenaline. And when you're in a controlled environment, like the comfort of your couch, it can be very stimulating. It's basically triggering the same reaction we have to watching horror movies and extreme sports. Psychologists have also theorized that the obsession with true crime, especially among women, can act as a survival instinct. Watching how other women fell victim to predators may actually ease anxieties of this happening to the viewer. Subconsciously, they feel they're garnering insight into how they might survive a similar attack, even if that's not necessarily the case. But beyond the individual reasons to watch true crime, there's also a social aspect to this obsession. It's why podcasts like Serial and series like The Jinx and Making a Murderer became cultural touchstones that you couldn't avoid talking about. 
and it's why the highly active fan base of the podcast My Favorite Murder lovingly refer to themselves as murderinos. A good true crime show can inspire the same water cooler conversation once reserved for fans of Lost. That's even if fans' only knowledge of the crime comes from the media itself. This tendency to want to put crimes into a narrative structure speaks to how we as a society deal with events that are so tragic they threaten our view of the world. True crime author and analyst Rebecca Frost explains that, in responding to situations that have disrupted communal order, the crime narrative functions as a restoration ritual that aids members of the community responding to and recovering from the presented threat. But rather than simply reflecting the crime itself, these narratives also tell us a lot about the societies that created them. Much like how the overly religious morality tales of early true crime pamphlets reflected the values of the late Middle Ages, today's crime narratives reflect our own values and beliefs. In sculpting the archetype of the cold-blooded killer, for example, the common contemporary narrative tends to focus on universally recognized modern psychology concepts, like childhood trauma. In this way, a supposedly objective retelling of factual events can inadvertently reinforce our own biases. Literary professor Mark Seltzer writes, True crime is crime fact that looks like crime fiction. It marks or irritates the distinction between real and fictional reality. Basically, true crime is all the sludge between what really happened, which we can't access, and what maybe happened, which we can speculate about until Reddit stops upvoting us. And the way these narratives have shifted over time can tell us a lot about how society has changed, especially in regards to crime and punishment. And to understand that, we need to come back to French philosopher and wisecrack icon Michel Foucault. In his 1975 book Discipline and Punish, Foucault compared and contrasted the archaic practice of public execution with our modern system of police and prisons. He questioned our current practice of institutionalizing criminals and executing the most heinous ones behind closed doors. And he asked whether it's any more humane than the good old days of drawing and quartering criminals for the whole town to see. Importantly, he examined how both of these practices are more about maintaining power than deterring crime. He argued that ending the practice of public execution was less about treating criminals more humanely and more about hiding the cruelty of the justice system itself. He wrote about the way public executions accustom spectators to cruelty in order to scare them away from committing crimes. At the same time, public executions turned executioners and judges into literal murderers, which was also really scary. But here's the problem. It also made people kind of empathize with the brutally tortured criminals. Big no-no. Where the true crime pamphlets of the past often reveled in the details of violent punishment, today's true crime rarely goes beyond the conviction of the crime itself. Instead, it focuses on the investigation and occasionally the trial and sentencing. But there's a problem inherent in this practice. See, the main source of information about these processes is inevitably the police and the prosecutors. And this gets ethically messy, because those parties have a vested interest in shaping the narratives around crime. See, the public is rarely exposed to the brutally punitive measures of the criminal justice system. And it's also fed a steady diet of the grisly details of the crimes themselves. This leads to a heavily skewed perspective. It's no wonder that multiple studies have shown that consuming large amounts of crime-related media is correlated with political support for more crime control and punitive measures. Focusing on the investigation also legitimizes the methods used by the authorities. Forensic sciences are used by police to investigate crimes, by prosecutors to establish guilt in the courtroom, and by forensics experts testifying in court and they're generally accepted by the judicial system and society as a whole, despite the fact that these techniques are rarely subjected to the same experimental rigor as other purely scientific theories. Ballistics, fingerprinting, and even aspects of DNA analysis have all come into question by the scientific community, and yet they're still used to put people behind bars. It's entirely possible we'll scoff at at least some of these methods someday, the same way we now know better than to rely on blood spatter or lie detectors. The role of the media in legitimizing these practices to the public has been a topic of debate among criminologists for decades. A 2004 USA Today article coined the term the CSI effect to describe the tendency of juries to demand ever more forensic evidence from trial prosecutors. Foucault addresses this as well, again contrasting these techniques with the medieval methods of establishing guilt, which usually consisted of, um, simply torturing the suspect until they confessed. These confessions were widely accepted at the time as clear evidence of guilt. After all, why would someone confess to a crime they didn't commit? It's now pretty well known that confessions made under duress are not reliable. That said, across the board, confessions made under a variety of sometimes suspect circumstances are still taken seriously under law, to much harm. 
According to the Innocence Project, 29% of recent DNA exonerations were cases where defendants confessed to murders they hadn't committed. And the same skepticism perhaps should be applied to our current methods of forensic investigation. Foucault argued that the expansion of the criminal investigation is less about establishing truth and more about reinforcing the power of the institutions which control the investigation. He explains that, among its many functions, forensic science grants the judicial system an illusory sense of scientific authority that is then treated as objective truth. It's also self-perpetuating in granting itself its own legitimacy. As we've said, the institution of the church back in the Middle Ages used true crime to reinforce its own necessity to society. Similarly, today's true crime may be working, intentionally or otherwise, to reinforce institutions like the police, the courts, and the prison system as a whole. Now, to its credit, the most recent wave of true crime seems to be taking an active role in examining the justice system itself. HBO's The Jinx detailed just how much criminals can get away with if they have money and social status. And Netflix's Making a Murderer showed us just how easy it is for law enforcement to manipulate forensic evidence and coerce confessions. And the popularity of these shows has had real-life consequences. The Jinx's Robert Durst was finally convicted of the murder of Susan Berman. Kill them all. Course. And when, for example, Serial's Adnan Syed and Making a Murderer's Brendan Dassey appeal their convictions, it makes the news. This new wave of true crime has also spurred the creation of communities of internet sleuths, who conduct independent research and exchange their results. This can sometimes lead to positive outcomes. The late Michelle McNamara spent years researching and compiling information on the serial rapist and murderer who would become known as the Golden State Killer. She, along with prominent internet crime daddy Paul Holes, can be credited with eventually tracking down the murderer. Of course, there's a dark side to this trend as well. Netflix's recent Cecil Hotel docuseries highlighted how internet sleuthing can easily snowball into fantastical conspiracy theories. This can have devastating effects on innocent people who were mistaken for suspects. They're saying, I'm a suspect for, for murder, murder of Elisa Lam. Not to mention re-traumatizing victims of crimes and their families. Aside from the ethics of true crime and internet sleuthing, we don't think it's a coincidence that these two phenomena emerge simultaneously. As we explained, mass media has both created and met the demand for true crime all along. That continues today. Netflix's true crime-related offerings alone grew 63% between 2018 and 2021, for example. But that's hardly the only effect of mass media. It also tends to democratize knowledge, which often leads to periods of great social upheaval. Take our old friend the printing press. This new technology didn't just create a boom in true crime. It's also credited with spurring the Protestant Reformation, which challenged the authority of the Catholic Church. See, expanded literacy rates, along with the widespread distribution of religious literature, led to a mass decentralization of religious knowledge. Without the need for a papal authority to interpret the scripture, differing religious denominations began to pop up all over Europe. This often led to heated and sometimes violent clashes between these different sects. It also instigated major crackdowns on dissent from religious authorities. It's no coincidence that during this time of social upheaval, people found escape in the allure of true crime. Along with easing their anxieties about the violence happening around them, it likely helped to reinforce their beliefs in justice and order. And our current time is no different. The internet has created a mass awareness about all kinds of injustices and abuses of authority, and inspired a number of mass social movements. During these uncertain times, true crime can be soothing for society. Watching individual injustices get properly investigated and even resolved is satisfying. And even true crime that highlights very real miscarriages of justice can make amateur sleuths feel that they're part of correcting those injustices, which is also satisfying. At a time when the world feels completely unpredictable, there is a certain comfort in the illusion of control that true crime presents us with. But at the same time, we gotta wonder, is the entertainment we're consuming weirdly reinforcing the very systems of injustice we're mad at? And are our guilty pleasures creating a demand for content that can only be met by exploiting tragedies and re-traumatizing victims? What do you guys think? Is binging boatloads of content about real-life violence A-OK -okay for our brains and our society? Or are we just exploiting tragedies for our own entertainment and peace of mind? Tell us what you think in the comments. Big thanks to our patrons for all your support, and check out our podcast. Smash that subscribe button with blunt force, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Peace.